Welcome to the Love the Star podcast. I'm Bobby Bell, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 through the fan in Dallas. Joined as always by former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broaddus. He is now the co host of the G Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 through the fan in Dallas. And he is also the pre and post game co host on the Dallas Cowboys radio network. Brian Broaddus, how are you today? Doing well, Robert. Thanks uh, for being here with me today. Always enjoy these uh, little podcasts we do. Yeah, absolutely. And we're doing this one on a day when rookie minicamp is getting underway for your Dallas Cowboys. They actually had some uh, media availability just a little bit ago, uh, kind of doing a walkthrough practice. And uh, Mike McCarthy will speak later this afternoon. Uh, and then on Saturday, they will get in a more formal workout, a more formal practice. Um but Brian, uh, before we dive into the specifics of rookie minicamp, um, only one player remains unsigned of the draft picks. That's just Marshawn Neeland. Otherwise, everybody else is on the books, ready to go for 2024, uh, including Tyler Guyton, their first round pick, who signs a four year deal for $13 million. And then, of course, a fifth year option that would be much higher than that. Um, but with viral photos going around yesterday of. Tyron Smith in a Jets uniform. It is a good reminder to say, hey, look, if you're able to hit on Guyton, you're talking about a player 12 years younger, um, under contract for several years, who doesn't have the same sort of health concerns that if Tyron Smith hits all his escalators, could make almost double in 2024 what you'd be paying Tyler Guyton for the entire four years of his contract. So just some perspective as as we're all, you know, feeling like maybe there's been some areas that they've stepped back. That's why it's really important that if the Cowboys have made this evaluation, the scouts have made the evaluation that Guyton is the guy, then if they're right in that evaluation, it could prove to be really beneficial to them in terms of the structure of their finances and, and other things that they want to accomplish. Man, if this kid has a career that's a quarter of what Tyron Smith is, I think you'd been happy with that. Yeah, you know, honestly, maybe even maybe even the path of what we've seen from Tyler Smith. Sure, you know, the first uh, few years of his career with the Dallas Cowboys. We always talk about plug and play. Well, here you go. Um, we've also talked about that maybe there's going to be some bumps along the way. Mm -hmm. I'm excited when we get to Oxnard here in the end of July and to really see him, you know, in nine on seven drills, in pass rush drills, in team drills, and in playing preseason games. I think we had an idea of what Tyler Smith potentially could be watching. And, and you know, we've seen it through the years. Zach Martins, the Travis Fredericks. Yeah. Maybe not so much of a Terrence Steele. No, Steele, the first I, I look, I'll be I'm I'm one of the ones who has come out and said totally wrong on that one in that, about that guy, when, when I saw Steele after his first season, I thought that there's no way he should even be on an NFL roster. Sure. And to his credit, that guy has worked his ass off and I think Terrence Steele has gotten every last bit of his potential out of himself because he's such a hard worker. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he's become a legitimate starting right tackle in the NFL. And when he's healthy, he's one of the better run-blocking tackles in the NFL. And so, um, yeah, I'm with you 100%. I I thought after the first year, I <laughs> this is a name blast from the past. I was saying, why are you letting Brandon Knight go? Don't let yeah. – no, you're letting go of the wrong guy. Brandon Knight needs to be here, not Terrence Steele. And uh, that's why I'm sitting right here on my couch right now, No, Brian. in the same way. <laughs> but I think if we look at – with Guyton and what we believe could be ahead of him, mm -hmm. it seems very promising. Yeah. I know from my evaluation, my own evaluation, um, watching him play, yes, there's some things, hands and feet. It was really kind of cool to see uh, – Duke working many with weather. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Right off the jump. What were they working on? Hands, feet, hands, feet. So, you know, Duke has a really great eye for these things. Mm -hmm. The players trust him. And so where, where Guyton is right now to where Guyton needs to be opening day is a pretty long way. Sure. But, but he's, he's got that kind of ability He's got that kind of makeup to be 
a good left tackle in this league. And I'm not going to sit there and say great. You know, great is reserved for guys that have played four or five years and doing this. But he's got the he's got the skill set to be a guy that could be a uh, you know when they when they look back and they say, well, there they go, they drafted another plug and play. Yeah, I, th- I hope for them. I, I think I mean that's a good point there, Brian. The the idea that you know. You, you don't want to say like, oh, he's got the chance to to be great right away or else because like, yeah. you don't want to assume so many things. But I, I think and you would also agree with this because you you were a fan of Guyton more so than yes. than some other people sure. were. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I had him on my stack. He was right at 24, which is where the Cowboys were initially picking. Right. And so for me, he was a top 24 player. That's all I want them to come away with is come away with somebody who's in the top 24. But Guyton is a guy, and I think you'd agree with this, in terms of the athletic traits and the the tools that are there. Now, if he puts them together, that's the question. But the tools are there for – those are the tools that great tackles usually have. The athleticism, right. the size, the, the – you length. know, Yeah, all of those things are there in his toolbox. It's just now it's a matter of, all right, time for the coaches to get that out of him um, and, and time to trust the evaluation of your scouts who – I don't know, Brian. It, we would probably say offensive line – is the position that Will McClay's scouting department has probably got the best track record of identifying and drafting in the last decade, I would say? No question. Um, they've, they've figured out corner, too, maybe, if you look at some yeah. of it. Now, we've seen – we'll see what happens with, you know, uh, McQuamu and those guys. I mean, maybe, you know, jo- Joseph was not a great fit, but, but you look at with Bland – and how they found him, the fortunate draft gods, Diggs getting to you at sixty when you yep. had a, you know, maybe you could have taken him at seventeen. Right. You know, there there's some there's some breaks along the way that you get. You know, we'll see what happens with Carson. I, I think Carson's gonna be a hell of a player myself. I do too. But the the thing with the way that they evaluate offensive and, and let's be honest too. They've had some different line coaches now the last couple of years. Yes. You know, usually usually the continuity of the line coach helps you with the evaluation of your players. And they've they've gone they've gone, you know, through a couple of different line coaches right now. And I, I will say this, and I think this is important, and I think you would agree with this, Brian. Obviously, they want harmony between here's our scouting staff, here's our right. coaches. We want everybody to understand each other and know what they want. I would say that I think I will say this myself. I, I don't want to speak for you, but I will say with absolute certainty, I think that they believe they have more of that harmony with their personnel department and Mike Solari than they did with Joe Philbin. Yeah, there's there's some you know, line coaches are very stubborn. Uh, you know, they 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 take a lot of pride. They call themselves well. Back in the day, they were known as the Mushroom Group, and it was the put them in the closet, keep them in the dark, and feed them s. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That makes sense, yeah. So, you know, they used to wear these shirts. You'd go to workouts, and all the line coaches would have these shirts on, these polos with mushroom on them, big mushroom. And it was their way of saying, yeah, keep us in the dark, feed us S, and watch us work. And so they could be really stubborn to work with. But you, as a personnel, again, I remember this in Green Bay, we had a guy named Tom Lavat, and Tom was a good coach. Tom was a poor evaluator, mm-hmm. but you know, and you have to know when a line coach is talking about moving a guy, well, we need to move this guy up. We got him too low. You know, we need to move this guy down. We've got him too high. Sometimes as an evaluator is running that room, you've got to know if your coaches can scout or not. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I think with Joe Philbin, you know, I, I I'm going to guarantee this. I think the scouts had a problem with Joe Philbin. And I say it in a way of, you know, the maybe there's some guys that they brought in that they really liked and the coach wasn't particularly too happy with. Yeah. And then all of a sudden coach goes into, Well, I'll show you MFers. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna coach the guy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push the guy. I'm not gonna you know, and maybe a guy like Connor McGovern had that, you know, happen to him. Oh, I think I think Connor, Connor McGovern Williams. had it happen to him. Yeah. I think um, I don't think Joe Philbin was a fan of Tyler Smith. Not at all. 
Um, but now, 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 to his credit, I don't, I don't want to just completely drag. To his credit, Joe Philbin believed Joe Philbin in a good Ter- coach. He he believed in Terrence Steele before anybody else did. Sure there, did. there were there were people in the personnel department who didn't believe in Terrence sure Steele, did. and Philbin did. Sure did. And so I, I don't want to just make it like brush all we're of it off. Not, not that you're doing that. No. Yeah, not that you, not that you're doing that. But I do think that it's important to have that harmony of the scouts and the coaches, and they all view the same. I think they have that harmony with Mike Solari. And so I think it's very important to know that, hey, you picked these three offensive linemen and and specifically Guyton they, and know you can have that. They had harmony with Dan Quinn. Yeah. You know, and I, I can go on record. Will McClay and Dan Quinn are like best friends. I mean, best seriously best friends. And mm-hmm. I mean, I've had Will McClay go after me about comments that I made about Dan Quinn. And, and, and I, I understand you know, I respect the hell out of Dan Quinn. I respect the hell out of Will McClay. I understand. You know, there's things I have, that, you know, beliefs that I have. And, you know, they're running a team. I'm I'm doing radio with you and enjoying doing radio and podcasts with you. Yeah. But there there is there is times where where as a as a scouting director or director of the program, general manager, you have to know which scouts can scout and which coaches can scout. Mm-hmm. Because if you let a coach get in there and influence you to the point where you won't take a player because of his personal feelings, when the room feels like, no, if you just coach my this is what I like about Mike Zimmer. Mike Zimmer is very much a, hey, here are my parameters. This is what I want in a corner. This is what I want in the safety. This is what I want in a linebacker. This is what I want in a defensive lineman. Parameters. Bring me whoever you want me to coach. You know, sometimes these coaches get a little stubborn and like, oh, that's not my guy. You got to take my guy. You know, I don't. And then now you're not coaching the guy. And then, and then all of a sudden, that's the teams that struggle every year that have coaching changes. Their Mm -hmm. team looks like this. They got short guys, tall guys, fat guys, skinny guys. I mean, they got their team has no symmetry to it. Yeah. You know. No, I think that's a great point. Look at the team, the Ravens. Their team looks the same throughout. It's not a hodgepodge of guys because yeah. of coaching staff's continuity, scouting staff continuity. Yeah, no, and I think I think that that's a, a good point and one of the reasons why I think you can feel good about the evaluations that they make along the offensive line. In general, the evaluations that they make, they're, they've – I know it's been a, a very negative offseason for a lot of people, yeah. and there's a lot of individuals who are frustrated with the results, rightfully so. As Stephen Jones said, it's been 31 years, or however long it's been, 30 years. It, you, you're you right to say, you know, you don't believe it until you, you see it. You have a right to feel this way if you're a yeah. Cowboy fan. Yeah, and Stephen, Stephen's acknowledged that, essentially. Just said, like, yeah, totally totally fair not for, for you not to believe us until you see it. I, I don't blame you. So that's I understand all that. The reality is, away from the emotion, the Cowboys have been one of the best drafting teams in the NFL over the last 10 years under Will McClay. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that this is an important step, starting rookie minicamp, getting some of these guys in here, and getting a chance to evaluate where they are. It's, like I said, it's very light. We're going to talk really quickly about what the expectation is at a rookie minicamp. First, uh, I want to remind you guys that you are listening to the Love the Star podcast. The Love the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian. So rookie minicamp getting going. Um, you know, there's, I believe, 20 rookies in camp right now. I think there are a couple of select veterans who are, are there as well. Five guys. Yeah. 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 So uh, a couple. Dick and some others, I think. Todd Archer was reporting that. Yeah, a couple different guys who are out there that – you know, just are there to get work in and and help provide some. They they fall under the rookie threshold yep. that allows them to do this for the amount of work that they had last year. Uh, it's like it's like a red shirt freshman year. Do you qual- did you lose your red shirt or not? Yeah. And so same sort of concept, but a uh, number of different people out there. Like we mentioned, Cowboys have signed their entire draft class except Neeland to this point. But Brian, I you know people will ask. They'll say, well, what are you what do you get out of rookie minicamp what is there that's on display what is there to learn so you know just from your scout perspective when you were on a team and you're a building team what would you step out to rookie minicamp and say all right this is what we're looking for today is it just hey let's get them on the field and figure out where are you in the classroom and how much work do we have to do yeah to be honest with you bobby i miss the days of jason garrett making des bryant throw up (laughs) yeah Yeah. there was there was a time when we were at Valley Ranch, there were competitive 
rookie mini camps. Mm -hmm. Like they would bring in a bunch of guys and there would be actual practice and there would be actual one-on-one. There would be actual to the point where Des Bryant, I remember his rookie year, he got, he got sick. He got sick. You know, and there's a lot of guys that, you know, you're just not in great shape and coaches have kind of figured out, you know, you bring these kids in they're They, they work to a point, they get through a season, they work through the combine and then they, they stop after the combine in their workouts. They stop. Yep. So you can't bring a kid in who hasn't really worked out since, you know, the the middle of April. You know, you can't you can't do that and just say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna run you and do this, do that. I mean, some kids will stay in shape and all that. Others are like, okay, whew, that's over with. I got drafted. Here we go. Yeah. So yeah, the most important thing for these camps, Bobby, in my opinion. On Saturday, if they have an actual practice, I'm always interested where guys line up. You know, where where do they think BB is going to play? Are they going to play him? They, does he look like he's playing center? Is he playing guard? Where are they working the linebackers? You know, yeah. I'm, I'm always interested in the corners. And I think when they do drills, you can see footwork and balance. It's helmets. It's T-shirts. Yeah, it's not ideal, but you get a visual of – how the player physically looks to your eye from watching him on tape. And then you get to see maybe a little bit of the movement skills. And then also, too, where the coaches are putting these guys. Yeah. And you can kind of get a little idea of that. You're not going to get the best evaluation you're probably going to get is when they all come together, when, they get to, when it gets to be the actual mini camp. Right. And you get the veterans here. And now you really understand – where they're lining them up, what teams they're running with, and in how they're playing competitively, uh, Carson covering CeeDee Lamb. Mm -hmm. That's that's when you're going to get. And then the ultimate is when we all get out to Oxnard. That's when you're going to see where these guys really fit. And every day of Oxnard that gets closer to the season turns into, okay, we don't – maybe the first 10 days of Oxnard – is about evaluating and seeing where these guys are at. After that, it turns to like, we got to get ready for a season. Yeah. And the guys that can play are going to be a part of this, and the guys that can't are probably going to be on the practice squad. You've always said, um, and I know it's something that is spoken about in league circles often, Mm -hmm. that when you get through these, this is the beginning of the process that you're going to play yourself off of the roster. This is day one of playing yourself off. There's yes. not that it can happen today, but this is the beginning of that process that ultimately when you go, man, we have all these tough cuts by the end of the day, we may feel like they're tough cuts. The Cowboys, I think a lot of times feel like we know exactly which 53 need to sure. be here. And, and and that's, it starts with this day. It's funny when we talk about, you talked about the movement skills. I remember you and I, I think we're both out at, um, the first rookie minicamp practice that they allowed us out for in 2020, I think it was, um, for Lamb and all the different guys that were there. And I remember talking to some people at the team later, and they said, for instance, one of the things that can stand out early, that's where they saw in that practice, which is not a tackle practice, it's not a full, fully padded practice, but you can see some different things. You saw that day, oh, Rico Dowdle's got juice. Yeah. Like this, this guy, can he can move. And I remember Pollard in 2019, very early in the rookie minicamp process. It's it's always been said to me that from talent evaluators and stuff, they're like, one of the things that you can tell when you're you're not in full pads, one of the things that will stand out on that football field is speed. Speed. If if you're fast a, a, on a field full of professional football players, that will stand out. Whether you're in pads or not, it'll go, oh, okay, that guy can he can he can move. And Pollard, I remember. That's where we were exposed to, oh, wow, he's he's got some juice. Dowdle, same sort of thing. So I will be interested, any backs that might be participating or in general, just like guys where you would look for speed as a big trait, like Ryan Flournoy or some of these receivers, like how much does that speed show up on that football field? There, there, are, things, there are things with, uh, and you mentioned Pollard, Lamb. You could see guys run. And when, when even in shorts and t-shirts, you know, they tag off, they run and then they like a two, like there used to be a game called two below, uh, you know, two hand touch, you know, below the waist and you know, you were down, no tackling. So they're tagging off on guys. 
all of a sudden you see the ball in someone's hand and the guy can't get over with the angle to get two hands on him. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're going, okay, this guy's got a little burst. He's got a little extended speed. You know, okay, there's some quickness there. Because when, so th when you see a guy run through the angle of a defender and that defender struggles to get to him to tag off, that's a that's a pretty good sign right there. Yeah, I remember Dowdle specifically, and it may I'm trying to remember if it was the rookie minicamp or it was one of the earlier OTA practices, but Dowdle specifically, I remember it was a play where they were kind of funneling everything off to the right side. He had gotten the ball, and like it's an obviously not a tackle zone. practice, but he got outside yeah. and he got to the edge so quick, and you saw him just maneuver through trap, and it was like you heard some some coaches kind of ooh, yeah. like you could yeah. see it. And so there are these there are these little traits that you can probably you know you know you can find you can put together. I'll tell you one of the things that I'm interested in whenever we go out and see these sort of things, Brian. I'm interested which coaches are where and which coaches are spending an intense amount of time maybe with a particular player yeah. or you know like for instance if if Mike Solari is separated from the rest of the group and like I don't know they've got Lunda Wells Lunda help out and uh, help help out with the offensive line for a little bit because Mike Solari is going to come over here and do snaps with Cooper BB for the next forty minutes like those sort of things where is Mike McCarthy if Mike McCarthy Mike McCarthy is usually standing off the side taking it all in if McCarthy's taking a particular interest and in kind of standing over somebody it makes you go okay what's the fascination here is this McCarthy wants to see them work something out is this a favorite player of McCarthy so he has an interest in okay how's he coming along so it, it's it's funny it's a little it's a little bit of a game of I mean it's kind of like a game when you're standing out there and you're watching it a little bit and go like oh what pieces of information are here that maybe I can go then take to somebody and say hey what what was this or or does this mean anything and then you start to develop a fuller picture but it all starts with this today yeah it does and you know I remember Micah Parsons rookie mini camp mm -hmm. it seemed like they were throwing so much at him and George Edwards was coaching at the time yep and he I mean it was it felt like 24 7 on that field with you know, with Micah you know, that George, and then they, you know, they move him over. And then George was constantly talking to him. And, and Micah was getting a lot. And then Micah, then we went to training camp. What did Dan Quinn do? Dan Quinn took him as a took him as a linebacker, then sent him down the other end, got some rush. And then, yep. you know, they, they were doing, they were putting a lot of, lot of, lot of weight on the wagon. And, you know, Micah Parsons was pulling the wagon for him, for sure. Yeah, you can – you you will see them test a little bit. I remember Jason Garrett had a we, – we had asked Jason Garrett this question about, like, hey, what is – what can you learn from rookie minicamp? What can you do? And Garrett had pointed specifically to a moment with Dak Prescott in rookie minicamp where Dak, if you'll recall, Dak never played under center at Mississippi State. No. Ever. Never. Um, and when he got to rookie minicamp – they were doing just a very basic drill of like, all right, snap the ball, step back, yeah. drive, hand the ball off. Like, it's just a drill of handing the ball off from right. under center. And Garrett said the first time Dak did it, it was he was like, that was awful. It was awful. And he was like, what are you What are you doing? And he has to go over there, do this, this, this. And Garrett said the way Dak just kind of internalized it and went, got it. And he's like, next one was a little better. Next one was a little better. Next one was a lot better. And it's he's like, it's one of those things where you start to learn about how te you know, how coachable some of these guys are, mm -hmm. what kind of students they are, how they internalize it. Cause they said very early on, that sounds like a very little thing, but just taking a snap from under center and driving and handing the ball off gave them enough evidence early on that reflected future work ethic from Dak Prescott that they were confident in. And so it is it is fun to get out there. It, look, I mean it's it's May 10th, Brian. We're, we're kind of starving for football a little bit here. It's a little bit of the desert. So this is mm -hmm. this is the first little breadcrumbs of, all right, here you go, minicamp, OTAs, everything else coming uh, coming into focus. Uh, before we go to the mailbag, anything specifically that you're interested in in hearing about or seeing? I know you mentioned Cooper Beebe, what, what kind of stuff he might be into. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Ryan Flournoy talked about, coming down here already and, and interacting with some people. And he said he's really connected with Trey Lance and that he and Trey Lance yeah. have, have had a lot of interaction and, and worked. And so it sounds like there's at least Ryan Flournoy is already trying to get some sort of 
connection or working with the quarterback room. Um, but anybody in particular that you're interested in seeing or or hearing how they're yeah, how they're about working Justin out there? Rogers, you know, yeah, it seems like a position that we're kind of you know there's there's a lot of questions there. I, I'm not the hugest Carl Davis fan, you mm-hmm. know, and we'll see what happens with you know this uh, Denzel Daxon they brought in. Uh, you know, I'm I'm looking at that. Uh, and Manny Johnson, I think I said his first name right, uh, the kid from Nevada, um, yeah. is a safety. I mean, he is a good-looking kid physically. Uh, he plays downhill. He's tough. I think he's got some cover skills to him. Uh, how about, you know, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, our linebackers here? Leah Fowl. Leah Fowl. How about, you know, we're – like I say, you can you can kind of see who they're and how they're going to work with them, inside, outside. You know, those there, there's there's plenty of there's plenty of guys to. I mean, everybody seems to be talking about this Nathaniel Pete kid too, the running back. Mm-hmm. That he's got a little bit of a burst to him, and some juice and stuff. So we'll see. Uh, Span Ford, the it's a hyphenated, you know. Uh, you know, Bevin uh, Span Ford, the the you know college free agent from Minnesota at yep. tight end. That is a crowded tight end room. If you look at now, Schoonmaker is not available right now, but you know Stevens is going to come back from injury. They like Fant enough. You know they've they've added Alec uh, Holler or two as a college free agent off the street. So they've added a couple of tight ends. That is a very very crowded room right now. When you look yeah, at, and what's going to happen when we get to when we get to um, we get to the mini camps where the veterans involved? You know what's going to happen at offensive tackle behind behind Guyton with Adoga, Awesome Richards, Matt Willetsko, you know Josh Ball. They moving him inside. I you know what happened? What's going to happen with you know, with Nathan Thomas and stuff? Can Nathan Tom? I, I floated this out there the other day, Bob, and I, I don't know if you. I don't even know if you would consider it. If things really, really worked out where Thomas looked legitimate, you know, and Adoga, they keep Adoga because of, I don't think you could get anything from Adoga, but could you move TJ Bass? Yeah, I know. I know you had talked about did that I, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we talked okay. about, about it a little bit. The only thing there obviously would be. How does everybody behind him look? Yeah, you'd have to feel comfortable with, with a lot. That's the one guy, if you talk about maybe, you're not going to get anything for Josh Ball. I'm sorry. You're no, not, not at this anything. point. You're not going to get much for Matt Well, let's go. No. Awesome Richards. I don't, you know, that's, that's a, you know, maybe somebody had Awesome Richards. I, I was going to say, let's maybe, I, maybe Richards, this. Richards with a grade a year ago, maybe somebody would have liked him. Bass should have yeah. been picked where Awesome Richards was, if you want to be really honest. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but... The, if if you if you've got some surplus, and you're really trying to, you know, you've got the compensatories, you've got your own picks. T.J. Bass is a guy that somebody might give you something significant for because people have seen him play, and seen him yeah. play at a pretty high level. And you're everybody's going, well, damn, Broadus, why are you getting away giving away a guy that you know is plays at a high level? And you got Zach Martin and all that. And I, yeah, but I'm also thinking about where this team could use some other players you know could they no. use could that help you get another uh could that help you get another linebacker could that help you get that one technique that you might need you no know, doubt i, I mean they've used a wide receiver that you might thinking about you know it seems like to me they're they're in the business now hunting these wide receivers yeah, well, and, and we had talked about we haven't even gotten a chance to talk about this since we came back martavis bryant was obviously released yeah, let go um, so, so Can we he, talk about too some of the stuff with Zay Jones. I give you my yeah, guess. yeah. We we talked about the Zay Jones stuff a little bit. I know we mentioned. Would you call up on Traylon Burks? The the Titans yeah, are apparently yeah. telling everybody Traylon Burks has a spot here. Yeah. We're 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 not done with Traylon well, Burks. Done so the research on this one already. Then that that that's the discussion anyway. That, that yeah. that's what they're talking about. But I will say this: the one thing, and I wonder if the Cowboys would be scarred by this at all. The idea of like, well, we got some depth. Let's move a guy we like. Because the last time I remember them doing that, obviously, was they moved Charvarius Ward. Charvarius Ward, yep. For Parker Anger, and they would have loved to have had Charvarius Ward for the last six years. You were you were not lying there. You were not lying at all. But but to me, 
if it's either going to surp, it's going to be working the waiver wire. You're down in the claiming. You're down low in the claiming area. You know, could they look at this running back room and say, you know what? Yeah, we're okay with Zeke, and, and you mentioned others. But is it is it by committee, and can we do better? And right. I know you floated out some ideas about adding guys. I know that Jane Slater uh, reached out to people about our guy at Pittsburgh. You know, they said that Najee Harris, clickbait, click whatever. Yeah. So, but there might be a point in time where all of a sudden it's like, well, maybe we're going to have to move somebody. It's go, it's going to be a discussion. Boy, moving TJ Bass, a lot of people like him. That's why it's our uh, Chill Boys ballsy take of the day. Maybe you trade him. So Brian brought us right there with that. Check out chillboys.com, yeah. promo code STAR, 15% off your order, underwear, socks, whatever. Wearing the socks and the underwear today as we're doing oh, the podcast. Look at that. So again, as we've told you guys, if you want to get into our underwear. The rotation. I wash laundry early to get back to the Chill Boys. I've got to order more. It's just that comfortable of an underwear. See, really that, that that's what it's about. So if you yep. want to get into our underwear, you can do it. Chillboys.com, promo code STAR, and that'll get you 15% off. You are listening to the Love the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, let's really quickly jump into our Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag. It's where we turn things over to our dear, sweet listeners. We have a lot of leftover questions from the last one that I was going to run through. Yeah, but I, did you see? I, I used the question that we asked. The other I day did. I, yeah, I, I used I used it on Sean and RJ. Uh, I asked RJ, question, and RJ man. was uh, RJ was a little. He was he was struggling with it, yeah. but it's a great question. So it so question. fantastic job from uh, Mr. Holler in there. Yep. First question here from Oliver De La Garza: If Steele struggles, obviously mm. coming off of the injury, um, but if Steele struggles. Uh, and Martin doesn't return. So we're talking about end of next year, probably 2025. Mm-hmm. Could Smith, Bass, Hoffman, BB, Guyton be a viable offensive line? Sure. You would be. Would you? Would you think Bass said, would play the left or the right side line, in that? Sure. Yes, it'd be Smith, Bass. If Martin's out. Martin's yeah, out. Martin's Martin retires. Steele's not working okay, out. They will tell you they think Bass is a better left, uh, excuse me, right guard. So, left guard. so you would put him over there, and then would you play Hoffman or BB at center, and the other at left guard? Or would you look at Nathan Thomas is maybe Ho- instead Hoffman, of Hoffman? Yeah, Hoffman's is is BB my starter at center in twenty twenty four. Um, sure. Under this scenario, yes, but you're entering 25. Okay, okay so I, then I got a center, I'm not So would you move Ho- would you play Hoffman at guard or Nathan Thomas in 2025? I would hope that Nathan Thomas would be my guy. But Tyler's I, I don't I am not the Ho- and they love Hoffman. They Mike love, Solari loves Hoffman. They love this guy. And every time we ever talk to Zach Martin about him, Zach says some positive things. This could be our version of Terrence Steele. I mean, Steele, we we you're right because we heard the same stuff about Steele, and we we're like, what are they First seeing? And then it the building, and then it clicked. Has to leave, always in the weight room, always asking questions, always being in the mix. Yep. You know, like they're talking about. I, someone told me the other day, man. I, I think it was Nick Harris. Nick Harris is like, man, I come in the building every day. Who do I see? Brock Hoffman. Every single day. He's there. Yeah. So, this might be our version of Terrence Steele. In, that, that we, that like I say, first in, last out, around the building, in the weight room, watching tape, getting better. And to that end, we're not saying that as any sort of like a, oh, he's a Boy Scout type thing. He's putting in the work necessary to get the most out of his potential. He's trying, he's trying, to, he's trying and, to win a job. They drafted, so, a guy, they drafted a guy to probably take his job. And and there there is so much when when you hear about those traits, I think it's easy sometimes for for fans to go like, ah, that sounds like maybe try hard behavior, or whatever else. It's like, no, those those when you have that work ethic, mm-hmm. that matters to coaches because they don't have to wonder if they're getting the most out of you. They know coaches, they're going to get the most out of you. Yeah, coaches love coaches love the guy that I just described. They they, they, they Joe Philbin loved Steele. And you we get results watching, from it. There, there, are, there, are, there are real world results from that kind of work ethic. Yeah, we're, we're watching him block at the Senior Bowl, and we're kind of like, my gosh, he looks horrible over there. Texas Tech, there was some struggles, and then you get here, and you're like, man, this is turning into like a self made guy. I mean, he's really working hard, and you know, sometimes those coaches say, well, you know, he's 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 always in. He's a student of the game. He's a gym rat, and you're like, and you want to laugh. You just want to go. <laughs> 
But yeah. then, but then those guys play, and you're like going, okay, I can't. You see it about this kid anymore. Yeah, yeah, you see it show up. And and Brock Hoffman, definitely a guy with a chip on his shoulder. He's got his podcast. You know what his podcast is called? Uh, the eighth guy, eighth round. The eight, the eighth round, yeah. which of course draft only goes seven rounds now. Yeah. So he's got the chip on his shoulder of like, oh, I'm one of the eighth round guys. But I'll tell you this though, um, to the question, those five guys, yes, you could play with. Yeah, I I think so too. You you'd have to figure out exactly what. What? spots you're comfortable yeah. with all of them but you could right. figure out you could uh, a that. grouping that i think would work all right next question here uh from gabriel if dak doesn't get extended we don't make the nfc championship game do you guys think it will be the trey lance show next year yes. is trey lance another athletic quarterback that is more of a runner or can he run an offense i know you know some people in san francisco do they believe he had the capability of being they, a field general guys in san francisco told me this if trey lance did not get hurt at and it, it was really unfortunate when he got hurt, he'd still be the starter. But then Brock, but then, but then Brock Purdy came along and Brock Purdy blew him away. Yeah. Seriously, Brock Purdy blew them away. And so that's why they were able to move on from Trey Lance. But there's people in San Francisco that will tell you, and they're not doing this to try and cover their ass because how high they picked the guy. Sure. They believed in the guy. They just didn't think he could stay healthy. To answer the question, if it moves on from McCarthy, moves on from Dak, I'll be interested to see what coach gets hired, and that's the case. Would he like Trey Lance? I could see them offering Trey Lance a contract where it is a – it's much like what they did with, with Jordan Love at Green yeah. Bay. They had the fifth year, but they they bumped it up. Instead of a $15 million deal, it was like $18 million or $20 million. I could see that because they're going to eat 40-something, $48 million. Dead yeah. money on Dak. So, you know, maybe it's a situation where they didn't get it done. Dak's gone. Yes, I could see Trey Lance being the guy at $22, 23000000 million for that and, year. And look, Trey Lance is all – Trey Lance, a big part of Trey Lance, and the reason why he went as high as he did is because the upside is off the charts. Like, if you want to talk about looks Jordan the part – like He's got some Jordan love to his game. If you want to talk about looks the part, he's a big guy, yeah. big arm – Great yes. athlete. Like, yes. there's stuff there to really like about him. Yes. Um, but obviously, it's... a second-round pick on him. They had a yeah. 1-2-0 grade. That's the top of the second round. If you've got 22 first-round grades, that's player 23 on your board. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next question here from Ty Gilbert. What player is most likely to have the greatest impact from the, to date, very disappointing 2023 draft class? I know we all default typically... I said we typically default to Overshown. Yeah, I because did, I he is the question. I answered the question live. Is what I did for the guy. I oh, Overshown. Overshown is the guy who they were really excited about mm-hmm. last year. Mm-hmm. So just taking it maybe a little bit outside the box. If, if you're talking about having a great impact, we already know about Mozzie Smith. I am going to be interested to see Fajoko. how does Mike Zimmer feel about Junior Fajoko. Yeah, me too. Because they were they were excited about him in the personnel department. Um, he was he guys, couldn't Eric he couldn't Scott. stay healthy. Eric Scott and Fajoko are from previous regimes. And yeah. so now it's, you know, and those are high. I mean, that, that Fajoko was a fourth round pick, right? Yep. That's, yeah. boy, that's, I mean, that's, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, to, to be fair, year removed and, and was, and was hurt. So, I no, mean, it, yeah, it's it, tough it, because if he doesn't work out, that's, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're going back, you're, you're going backwards there. Yeah, but I mean, an opportunity for him to potentially win a job here, especially with some of the the, the thin spots. At yeah, yeah, yeah. Just on the defensive line in general. All right, uh, let's get to the, get this last question in here from Ryan. Ryan says, with the offensive line getting upgrades in this draft, and we're going to play a little hypothetical here. What are the most likely spots that they invest premium draft capital in next year? So I think if you look at the roster and just try and project out a little bit and think guys who could be gone or positions that are getting older, I mean, quarterback. quarter if they walk away from their quarterback, that might yeah. be one. Quarterback, um, one. Receivers Maybe a little thin. Back. Maybe yeah, running back. could be. Receivers a little thin right now. They've got CD, yeah. but I, I mean, Brandon Cooks is a really good player, but Brandon Cooks is obviously not a long-term solution what about here. Tolbert? You know, that's a big question right now. Yeah, I mean, you're probably going to look at – does Neeland cover everything you want to invest in at defensive end, or do you say we probably need to go get another edge rusher next year? I think Neeland, I think Neeland moves from the right side to the left side, and then they figure out what's going on. Sam Williams needs to play well for them. Yep. Because 
you know, maybe you play Neal in, in some run situations until he becomes an adequate pass rusher. I think that's the only thing holding Neal in back right now is his pass rusher ability or lack of it in my yes. opinion. The same, same sort of situation in terms of with Guyton, in terms of... Now, Nealon's got some, like you've talked about before, Nealon's not as bendy as typical edge rushers. I don't think, yeah, that's... But, but the, the length, the power, some of the other stuff, again, the toolbox is there if you can work yes. with it. And, and so you just need him to put it together is obviously the thing. All right, that does it for us here today on the Love the Star podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, go check out chillboys.com, promo code STAR, 15% off. You are not going to regret it. Uh, For Brian Broaddus, I'm Bobby Belt. We'll talk to you guys again later. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.